If you want to get a head start, you can turn to Isaiah 55 in your copy of the scriptures, or if you have a device with you, Isaiah 55. And uh, if you want to read the identical wording to what we'll be reading this morning, just uh, if you Google Isaiah 55, it's NIV. NIV is what I'm reading out of this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 11. We'll have it on the screen too if you don't have any of those options available to you. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. You know, failure, failure comes naturally for us. None of us, not a single one of us can say we've never failed. Now, some failures are bigger than other failures. They stick out a little bit more, but the reality is every one of us has failed. True? Okay, well, at least five of you have failed. (laughs) I read um, recently an assistant of Thomas Edison. You know who Thomas Edison is. An assistant once tried to console him over the failure to achieve in a series of experiments what he set out to find. Here's the assistant says, oh, it's too bad. He says, too bad to do all that work with no results. Oh, said Mr. Edison, we have lots of results. We now know 700 things that don't work. (laughs) You know, Thomas Edison was the chief of failures. We don't look at him that way, do we? Because he had a big success, and, uh, and here they all are around us with the light bulbs. So just to prove that we're all failures, <clears throat> um, think of a number between one and one million, okay? Think of a number between, get that number in your head. <clears throat> if you need to write it down because you have short-term memory, write it down. A number between one and one million. <clears throat> okay, you ready? Was it 611,072? No. Okay, you're all failures. You are all failures. You know, we're so used to failing. We've even come to accept it in a number of situations. <clears throat> but sometimes we can be so used to failing that, that succeeding surprises us uh, sometimes. But think about this. For God... Failure has never happened. God has never, ever experienced failure. Everything that God has said, everything that God has planned, has turned out and come to pass just as he said it or designed it. From eternity past through now, God has never ever failed and and just think about this through the billions of people that have existed through the trillions and trillions of situations that have gone on or even possible situations that have gone on through all of the world's history and then even prehistory of the world god has never failed ever So here we are in Isaiah chapter 55, 8 through 11, and the prophet Isaiah comes in a spectacular passage to illustrate this very truth that God never fails and his word never fails. So here we are in Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, and what essentially we're talking about in big words would be God's infallibility that he never fails in any way, and that his infallibility is foundationed on, here's another big word for us, his sovereignty, or the reality that he rules is in complete control of everything. So God's in complete control, and so everything he does will come to be just as he has said. So here we are, Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, And it's going to pop up on the screen. But follow along in your copy of scriptures as we read this morning. This is the words of God to Isaiah, 600 years before Jesus was born. Notice what he says. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Now notice the contrast. 
as the heavens are higher than the earth, So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Then he goes in this beautiful description. He says, you know, as the rain and the snow come down from the heavens and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Tremendous words outlining the reality. God never fails, and everything he says will be exactly as he says it. So if you're taking notes, here's some things to write down, or if you have something in the margin of your Bible, or maybe you want to grab your notes on your iPad or your iPhone or whatever may be the case, here's a couple things to put down for us to interact with this morning. Number one, God's plans and thoughts don't fail. God's plans and thoughts don't fail. Now here's the reality that Isaiah mentions, he says, As high as the heavens are above the earth. Now, I don't know if we put that together in our minds this morning. Sometimes we just look at the air above us and you think, yeah, that's a little ways up there. Well, this isn't what Isaiah is talking about. He's saying, you know what? I want to show you the contrast of God's thoughts and plans to ours. He says, as high as the heavens are above the earth. So now that we're talking in millions like we did at the very beginning, let's just talk about it right now. The nearest star, our sun, is how many millions of miles away? Exactly. 93 million miles away. Now that's a walk to the mailbox compared to the heavens, which are infinitely higher. They're incalculable. We're talking trillions of light years out there. There's nothing to compare the distance that we have to there. It's just incomprehensible. And so the writer is saying, you know what? If you want an idea of the extreme chasm of God's thoughts and his plans to us, That's an idea. And he's not saying that we're close. He's not saying that we can figure a lot of this out. He's saying, you know what? He is way beyond us. He's in another world. He knows all things past, present, and future. He even knows all possible things that could have come true. And he has a plan and desire to accomplish those things and his decisions and plans and thoughts are absolutely perfect. Now, I'm going I'm to give you another verse that highlights this and amplifies it. If you want to write this down, this is dynamite. This is what the Apostle Paul said about the same exact theme in Romans 11, 33 through 36. So if you mark in your margin, this is one that goes perfectly with Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. Romans 11, 33 through 36. And here's what it says. It says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. You know what he's saying right there. There's no way. We're not even close to figuring out God or his paths or his design. And then he goes on, who has known the mind of the Lord? Now, these are rhetorical. Don't say, me. No, it's none of us. Who's known the mind of the Lord? I love this one. Or who has been his counselor? Can I just share with you? God doesn't ask for advice. He doesn't need it. I once saw a meme, which are close to Scripture. Just kidding. (laughs) And it says, we often love to serve God on an advisory basis. True? God, here's what you need to do. I've got it all figured out. 
This is, this is exactly how you should plan this. And, and the writer just says, you know what? God doesn't need advice. And he says, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? God doesn't owe us anything, but here's what he does owe. He owes the glory to himself. And he goes on in this doxology, he says, for from him, through him, and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now let's get personal for a few moments. His plans never fail. We need to distinguish this because some of you are sitting here today and saying his plans don't fail. Brian, you don't know my life right now. You don't know what I'm going through right now. This looks like a total flop. Brian, you don't know my past. You want to talk about his plans never failing? Can I just share with you my failures, my flops, my sins, the destruction that's been in my wake most of my life, and you're telling me God's plans don't fail? I need to speak to your heart here for a moment like Isaiah does. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's not for our good. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's not for our good. Just because we don't understand doesn't mean God doesn't. Just because we fail doesn't mean his plan is failing. I know we can pull a brain muscle on this, but I I want to give you a quote, and this is so significant. God's plans don't fail even when they involve my failure. That's how intricate God knows of all things. And if you're wondering, is that true? Just go through the Bible. Look at all the failures. We can just name them. Some of the people that we look up to, like King David, which we're going to be having a a new series on David called Up Close and Personal starting in August. Failure, Abraham, failure, Noah when he got off the ark, failure, time and time and time again, Adam and Eve, failure, and you think, man, what's going on with God's plan, and the reality is, remember, God's plans don't fail, even when we do, he has something that's beyond us, his ways are higher than ours, As high as the heaven is above the earth. His plan isn't based on my infallibility. It's based on his infallibility. One person has said when God planned our calling, he factored our stupidity into it. Isn't that comforting, huh? And we all have stories. We could do a roaming mic here this morning. We all have stories where God's plan didn't fail even though we did. Don't we? Like, I I just, when I was working through this this week, I just thought, okay, Brian, what, what do you have in your history that shows God doesn't fail even though we do? Well, First thing, I was born in New Jersey. (laughs) True story. And I still made it, people. I'm the product of my dad's second marriage. My wife was adopted. We both were engaged to other people before we met each other double failure, which we're very thankful for right now. (laughs) Can I just expose another one? This is about um, maybe eight or nine years ago. Uh, Through a number of series of events, we found ourselves, like many, many other people, hurting and struggling financially and even crippled with debt. 
Maybe you can identify with this, maybe you can't, but that, that's just the reality of where we were. My sister had a timeshare down in um, Virginia that we decided to take a vacation to Williamsburg with some friends, and so that's what we did, and I've, I've shared part of this story in the past. And so cheapy, cheapy vacation, we took her up on it, we went down to Williamsburg, some other friends came with us, and so that Sunday we decided, let's, let's go to a church all we did was Google, you know, churches in Williamsburg, Virginia, and then we looked through the long list and we said, you know what, let's go to this one. And um, the name of that church was Crosswalk Community Church. So here we, we go into this church. We've never seen it before. We've never visited afterward. We went to Crosswalk Community Church. And, and here the pastor's up front, and I know my situation. I know that we're hurting. I'm thinking, here's this hole. How in the world do we ever get out of this hole and wouldn't you know it, the very week that we went, of all the weeks that we could have gone to that church, the pastor's speaking about getting out of debt. I thought, boy, did we pick the wrong church? Let's get on Google again. And here I am sitting there listening to the pastor talking about financial freedom and how we're oftentimes crippled for doing more for God because we are subject and servant to another master called debt. And I'll be honest, here I was in ministry, here I'm a pastor, and I'm looking at this, and I'm listening to him, and I'm saying, how in the world, like, I, I don't see how we could ever get out of this. I'm, I'm failing. How am I ever going to get out of this debt? And we left there, and we talked about it, and it ended up, I don't have time for all of it, but through a crazy series of events called God's Faithfulness, two years later, we were out of all financial debt except our mortgage. And we were blown away. And I remember that pastor from Crosswalk Community Church saying, you know what, you don't get out of debt for yourself. What God has done for you shouldn't end with you. This is so that way God can do something greater with your resources than paying other people. And so here we were. I came home from work. This is the part of the story some of you may have heard. I came home from work, and I asked my wife, hey, any mail today? And she's like, nah, you know, just some junk mail. And I looked in the garbage where the mail was, and I pulled what was on the top, and I looked at it, and here was this mailing from some other people in New York State, which is where we were at the time, and they were encouraging people to host a Ukrainian orphan girl. This was not on our radar. We weren't thinking at all about this, but here God had freed up some of our finances, and, and instantly God started working on my wife and I, like, is this something we should do? And, and so she said, well, call. And, and so I did. I called, and here's, the, here's what they said. They said, we, are, we have four kids coming from Ukraine. They will not be able to come unless someone hosts a fifth. And I'm like, oh, boy. And they said, and we need to know by tomorrow morning. So we took our family out to Friendly's, and we talked about it, and we prayed about it, and we decided, let's go for it. And we came back, and we called them the next morning. We said, okay, uh, we'll do it. Sign us up. And then they said, okay, you need to go online. You need to print this stuff off. You need to sign these waivers. And you need to make out a check, and you need to send it in the mail right away. So that's what we did. We went home. We pulled it offline. We started signing all these papers and everything like that. And then now is the time to write out a check to be able to send to whatever organization this was. And I asked my wife, who am I making the check out to? Are you ready for this? Are you sitting down? She said, you're making the check out to, right as she's reading it online, she goes, you're making the check out to Crosswalk Community Church in Williamsburg, Virginia. <gasps> Two years later, after that crazy preacher said, you need to get out of debt so you can care for God's work, we had no idea. Okay, can I just say this? As high as the heavens are above the earth, and that's not close, so are his thoughts above ours 
and his plans beyond ours. God's plans don't fail even when they involve our failures. So can you figure it all out? The chance encounters, the song on the radio like, I needed that, the publication that comes out, the words spoken, the timing for your devotional, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his thoughts and his plans above ours. One wrote a poem, and I'm not a big poem guy, but this says it. He says, he, speaking of God, he writes with characters too grand for our short sight to understand. We catch but broken strokes and try to fathom all the mystery of withered hopes, of death, of life, the endless war, the useless strife. But there with larger, clearer sight, we shall see this, his way was right. His plans never fail. Let's go to number two. And since this is a series on Scripture and its importance to us, here's number two. This is so cool. Not only do his plans never fail, God's words don't fail. God's words don't fail. And so look, look here at the text. He just lays it right out in this beautiful illustration, he says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, we're familiar with all of that, and they don't return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. And notice it's not merely just for the plants. It goes beyond that, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve for the purpose which I sent it. So here's the idea, this infallibility. God's words don't fail. Here's what infallibility means. It means that the words, the claims, the promises, the prophecies, of God's word will never fail to be what he says they will be. None of it will fail. Everything that God has said, whatever you see in the text, all of it will come to be. And so he gives this beautiful illustration. If we can wrap our minds around it, we understand that precipitation comes down and it waters the earth. And my lawn a few weeks ago was saying, we need some serious watering right here. Our garden was saying, we need some serious watering. And so, you know, here comes the water. Great. It, it watered the earth. That's not the whole plan. Because he goes on and he says, not only does it water the earth, look what it does to the plants. They bud, they flourish. And we say, wow, that was a great plan. He watered the earth to make the plants bud and flourish. That's not the whole plan. Because he says it goes beyond that. It goes beyond rain coming down. It goes beyond watering the earth. It goes beyond making the buds and flourishing of the plants. He says, here's what, here's what the plan is. It's for you. It's going to impact you. It's going to be seed for people that sow seed. It is going to be nourishment for the eater. And so we look at this and we say, man, the ground sure could use some water. That was good. Man, my plants look a lot better, but God's plan with his word is so much bigger than the surface, so much bigger than the superficial. Because when he relates us to our lives, God's word is like rain, he says. This is like my word coming down like rain on the land. And my word isn't just for the land, and it's not just for the plant. He says it's to make a difference in your life. Is to change your life. There is an end goal that God's word like rain has. It doesn't go back to him with this evaporation. It doesn't go back to him without first doing everything that he wanted it to do. 
And the beauty of it is it's not merely for the plant and it's not merely for the ground and the soil. Ultimately, the purpose of his word is to change us, to impact us. Our lives will be different, and this is the whole point. The whole point is God has a product that he intends to bring about in your life and in my life. He wants to bring a harvest. His word is going to bring it. It's his word that ultimately does it. And it will not be stopped. All God says will happen for his purpose and our good. It can't not happen. His character is at stake. If God says something will be and it doesn't, then he's not God, period. But he has a plan for you. And it involves his word watering your life and making buds and making things flourish so that way we feast on it and are changed. So I want to talk to you about this as we finish up. Here's the beauty of Scripture. Water your life with God's Word. Water your life with God's Word. Do you feel dry, barren? Nothing is changing. Can I say, nothing will change unless we water our life with God's word. Think about it, friend. God wants to change, nourish, flourish people. And he says, my word is what does it. My word is the game changer. My word is what brings that. And so the admonition for you and for me, that's where we need to be. There's no other way. So here's what I want to put out to us. Get water daily. Get water daily. If you're saying, Brian, I don't, I don't know how. What do I do? I've mentioned it before. I, I go on the Bible app. That's one thing. Um, if you don't have the Bible app, you, just, you need to go to the app store. You need to go and search for the U version, Y-O-U version, Bible app, and it'll come down. There are devotionals galore. They'll set up reminders. They will hound you until we're watering ourselves daily with God's word. Here's another thing you can do. Any Hobby Lobby people here? Oh yeah, I know, I know. I see, I, yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Um, there's a, a devotional book, New Morning Mercies. A devotional book for every day of the year. I can see some women saying, honey, I need to go to Hobby Lobby for that devotional book. He'll see right through it, so don't even try it. New Morning Mercies. One, another good thing you can do, have a buddy. H have someone that you keep in contact with and that keeps in contact with you say, hey, are you watered today? Maybe you guys go through the same thing. And you compare notes. Because we need to be watered every day with God's word. And we ask ourselves these questions because it's not just to read it and check a box. Because ultimately God's goal for you with his word isn't just a discipline it's a life change, and so we ask ourselves these questions. Think about these. God, what do you want for me to learn about you? God, what do you want for me to change in my life? What do you want for me to do? Because God's word is for you, to change you, to change me. Water your life with God's word. Here's number two. This is a big one. Because we just learned his way is unfallible. His paths 
will never fail. His thoughts are unfailing. And so here's number two, trust God no matter what is going on in your life. And I just might be stepping on a nerve here this morning. What's going on in your life? What's going on in my life? We need to trust God. No matter what is going on in your life. Now there's a, there's a verse, two verses I love in Proverbs 3. There's verses 5 and 6. I'll pop them up on the screen for you. These are phenomenal verses verses to think about trusting God no matter what's going on in your life. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's where trust happens. Do I have confidence in him? Do I have assurance in him? Do I really believe he won't fail me? That his ways are best. Trust with all your heart. And here's the other one. Don't lean on your own understanding. We know we're not trusting when we start to devise our own ideas, our own plans, our own way to manipulate things. Or you know what? I don't necessarily need to do what Scripture says because I think this will help me get to the end I want. It says, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, we acknowledge Him. God, it's your thoughts. It's your plans. It's your way. And He'll make your path straight. That's trusting. Having confidence, not freaking out, not giving in to the anxiety and worry. Assure ourselves his way is perfect. He's got it figured out. Maybe singing in your head, he's got the whole world in his hands. He certainly does. Let's not superimpose on God our way but rather stay obedient to his word no matter what's going on. So would you stand with me for a moment because there very well may be something that you need to think about and I need to think about today. What's going on in your life? What's going on up there? Maybe even something that you don't like. I tell you something. You need to hear this because I needed to hear it this week. God's plans don't fail. Even when we think we are. They don't. God has your circumstance and he has you and he has something beautifully crafted for your life and for mine. So would you close your eyes with me? Would you think about what that is? What's going on? Would you assure yourself God's in control? God's in control. I can trust him. I don't understand it because I'm not God. Assure yourself of that. Would you even talk to God right now and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for not having confidence in you. Forgive me for manipulating. Forgive me for trying to change things or superimpose my plan on something that is a much greater, grandiose plan of yours. Would you talk to him right now? God, we know you will not be denied. We turn on the news. We see world issues, political issues, challenges that face our own life and finances and relationships. And we wonder what's going to happen. But God, you and your word will not be denied. And we're so glad. God, thank you that your infallibility doesn't depend on our infallibility. We trust you. You're God. We yield. And we obey. God, for my friends here, as well as myself, we all have a collective prayer. Work in us, Father. 
Work in us with your word. Grow things in our lives by which we can eat and be nourished. God, may your word do its purpose in us to change us. And may we be watered daily. God, we trust you. We believe you. And together we say amen and amen. Let me just tell you one thing. Trusting trusting is the lifelong purpose of the follower of Jesus. It's how we get in in the first place. It's how we become a Christian. We need to trust Jesus, that he died on the cross for our sin. It's all about trusting him. Our way in to the family of God is only by the cross. I can't get myself in. Don't trust yourself. I can't make God approve of me because I have so many sins in my account. But we trust Jesus that when he died, he bore the punishment for our sin. Trusting God is at the starting place of our walk with Jesus, and it's every step thereafter. Trusting him. His way is perfect. His plan will never fail. Friend, I pray for you, and I pray you will see some of God's genius in your past and even in your present and in your future. And if you ever want to talk about it, grab someone around you, connect in your small group, and give the office a call. But God's plan will not fail for your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a great day. Oh, can I tell you one other thing? We have neighbors here. I wanted to mention that. We have neighbors here called Grolos. And I've just been wondering, they may be struggling with this whole stinking circle thing and how it's affecting their business. So I've never done this before in my entire life, but I'm going to tell you, we did stop there the other day, and, and they could use some business at Grolos. And you want to know what's really hurting? You're going to love this. Their ice cream sales. You could say, I'm doing the will of God. <laughs> yeah, you all already apply God's word right now, huh? I know, yes. Um, let's support them and love on Grolos and just tell your kids we're, we're helping our neighbors by going to get ice cream tonight. Um, but let's support them and love them. Let's trust God. Let's water ourselves daily in his word. Have a great day. God bless you.